Well, good evening, everybody. My name is Robin Archer, and I teach uh, political sociology here at the London School of Economics. And I'm very pleased to welcome you on behalf of the Department of Sociology to our event tonight with Paul Mason and Leia Upi. Paul Mason is a major public intellectual by any standards. He has a long record as a journalist, a broadcaster, an author, and an activist. Some of you may remember his role as the business editor on BBC's Newsnight or the economics editor on Channel 4 News, which brought his analysis to a wide public audience. But before all of that, he had an earlier career as a music teacher and a lecturer of music. And more recently, he's been focusing on his writing, which has resulted in an impressive series of books. His books include, and this is inter alia, there are others, they include Live Working or Die Fighting, How the Working Class Went Global, Why It's Kicking Off Everywhere, Reflections on the Revolutions which Broke Out in Various Parts of the World in the Early 2010s, Post Capitalism, and also his latest book, How to Stop Fascism, which you'll be talking about tonight. Leia Upi is Professor of Political Theory at the London School of Economics. She is the author of a prodigious number of scholarly books and articles concerning democratic theory, uh, other questions of normative political theory, theories of justice, nationalism, questions about immigration and membership. And she's thought deeply and at some length on questions to do with Marxism. I should mention that she too has a book out just right now uh, called Free, about her life growing up in Albania. And though that will not be the topic of our talk tonight, there is an event at the LSC coming up, I think um, you can nod if it's due on the 1st of November, I believe, in which you can hear her talk about that. Well, the plan tonight is for Paul to sketch out a few of his arguments rather briefly at the beginning, maybe for 10 or 15 minutes, and then um, Leia and Paul will be in conversation with each other for perhaps 25 minutes, and then we'll open up to, to you in the audience for questions and discussion. Please put your questions um, in as it's directed, and some of them, of course, will be fed, fed to um, our speakers. We obviously can't deal with all of them, but we'll try to get a representative group. So before we do that, can I ask you to join me? I feel I need a sort of clapping machine, but can I ask you to join me in welcoming our speakers, Paul Mason and Professor Leia Ippi. Ippi. Well, thank you for that, uh, Robin. Uh, and I'm going to start my 15 minute timer now. It will go off. Um, so, yeah, and, and it's great to be um, virtually hosted, as always, by the LSE. I'm incredibly grateful for the platform the institution has given me and the hearing that I hope we'll get tonight, me and Leia, together. So just, I, I want to outline the arguments of the book to hopefully an audience that might know something about it. Uh, sometimes I'm out in, you know, the wilds of, of, of Middle England, starting from scratch. I won't do that tonight. Um, if anybody doubts the relevance of a book about the modern far right and the political philosophy which underlies it, uh, and, and I have to tell you that quite a lot of people do, quite a lot of them, um, uh, people don't want to, newspapers don't want to review this book because they say, what's the, what's the problem? Um, Trump's gone. Uh, fascism is tiny. Um, just in the last, in the last, well, it's not even a week. On Saturday, Roberto Fiore, the leader of the Italian third position movement in fascism, led a mob to storm the HQ of the main Italian trade union movement, Sigil. Uh, this is almost 100 years to the day that they did the same, that Mussolini's Squadristi did the same thing. Um, on Sunday, the British broadcaster, Jeremy Vine, his house was uh, surrounded and picketed by a group of anti-vaxxers, again, apparently with links to the far right, who um, online issued death threats to him. Um, today, there's been a march through Kiev, a large march, and again, uniformed, militarized, angry, violent, um, calling for the downfall of the government, uh, white nationalists and Nazis openly displaying their symbols. And we're only 10 months away on from the attempted storming of Capitol Hill by a mob incited by the president and clearly from the indictments, including 
organized members of the far right and include in also armed far right militia people. Now, what that says to me is that um, Maurice Bardesh was right. Maurice Bardesh, Bardesh was a French fascist, lifelong anti-Semite, Holocaust denier, who wrote in 1961, um, with another name, another face, and with nothing which betrays the projection from the past, with the form of a child we do not recognize and the head of a young Medusa, the order of Sparta will be reborn. That was the sort of 1960s French uh, code for fascism, Nazism indeed. Um, we are, one of the things that, that inspired me to write this book was, to, was seeing activists, uh, modern day activists, struggling to make sense of the reemergence of not simply far right organizations, but far right philosophical tropes and arguments and pseudo scientific, um, well, pseudoscience, um, and, and continually reaching for something that's quite natural that a young modern person would reach for, which is academic definitions of fascism. Um, the problem is there are many of them, uh, and they are not, you know, they compete. They are not necessarily coherent. And from my point of view, they're nearly all um, me either methodologically wrong or sort of 10 years behind the evidence. Um, and it occurred to me that and with my labor movement background, when the labor movement in Germany and Italy actually confronted fascism in real time, it, it was not reliant simply on academia. It, it had, as it were, ownership of developing the theory itself. The famous debate in Germany, uh, the, the article Panic in Mittelstand, uh, where, where the German social democracy tried to get its head around the sudden surge of Hitler in the polls. The debate around that was had in a trade union theoretical journal. I'm not certain such things exist anymore, but I want to try and move the debate on from where it's been uh, on the left, uh, or, uh, from kind of typo typological definitions inherited from sociology and history and, and sociologists and history historians um, have used their definitions quite rightly, very often as, as research hypotheses. Research hypotheses are needed, but they don't necessarily help us um, in praxis, in activism. And so I wanted to try and do three things in the book, describe modern fascism in a way that it's not often described. You, you can pick up a report, um, the German government's just produced a very good uh, report on the European far right. You can go on the, the websites of CREX, Hope Not Hate, and every year they produce a, you know, a, a kind of zoology. What does this group look like? What are its symbols? How many members? What's it been doing? I wanted to do something deeper. I wanted to try and examine the, the, the phenomenon from the point of view of kind of political philosophy and, and also action, what, what I'm seeing, what I'm hearing, what I'm feeling, what I'm what I'm touching and who is touching me, unfortunately. Um, what the main phenomenon that I think we're observing with not simply the rise of a new active violent far right uh, internationally, but the crossover of, it, of its ideas into what, what have we, we've spent 30 years studying, something called right wing populism. And if you go on, again, the European Union website, you get the, typo the typology uh, of right-wing right -wing populism versus fascism. There's actually an official European Commission definition website, and it says fascists are violent, militarized, um, often prone to genocide. Um, they want to bring down democracy. Right-wing populists are nonviolent, use democracy, use racist language, but do not um, threaten uh, to bring down the state. And, and I mean, I think that's generally been true. UKIP is not patriotic, patriotic alternative. Uh, the, the, uh, the Front National in France, in its genesis, in its movement towards Rassemblement uh, National, has you know, shed elements of fascism and adopted elements of right wing populism. These are per perfectly valid definitional uh, terms. The problem is, and, and this is what the book is about, any idea that right-wing populism would ask, act as a firewall against the return of far right has to be abandoned. In fact, the firewall is on fire and, and, and the form the fire takes is the crossover of a, of a rigidly, and so rather a rigid, sophisticated, structured fascist ideology into the world 
where which has been hitherto structured by prejudice and anti-theory. So, you know, Salvini, Farage, Trump himself, these are not theorists. They despise intellectuals. But the fascist ideologists, Carvalho, um, Dugin, uh, Guillaume Fay, uh, and, 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 and the French New, New Right movement, they are theorists. And what has happened, I mean, I had a personal experience of it in, on Whitehall in 2019, of being surrounded by people shouting into my face, you know, Paul Mason, you're a Marxist, you've betrayed our country, we've researched you. When, you, when I look back at what they were saying and, and who they were, many of them were you know, quite uneducated people, many of them my age, people who've probably been in, uh, on the periphery of the far right UKIP and the Brexit party for a long time. But the ideas in their heads suddenly have structure. And the structure, what I wanted to do in the book is to examine that structure. Yeah, what, what, how has fascism been reborn? What I think has happened is that you know, when I was chasing the, the NF and the British National Party around East London in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, we were dealing effectively there with, 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 an, with, with a, a kind of organic British fascism. It was, uh, it had two characteristics. Um, it, first of all, it was a, tri a, a closet tribute band to Hitler. You know, we, if you've seen this Ridley Road um, series, you know that they, they were wearing swastika armbands in their bedrooms uh, while appearing with Union Jacks on the streets. Um, the other feature, the original British fascism of the post-war era had was that it was, I call it organic. It was young men whose fathers had been Mosleyites drinking in all white racist pubs in East London, in West Yorkshire, parts of Manchester, Glasgow, uh, Northern Ireland. Um, and it was quite rational. If, if wrong, they just didn't like migration and they thought the world was going to shit. Uh, and if you'll excuse my language, and they wanted to revive fascism. Today's fascism is not organic. It can spring everywhere. It's springing up very rapidly through using networks. And it is deeply irrational. It is not based on personal experience. In fact, it conforms exactly to what Hannah Arendt wrote when she wrote in the uh, on totalitarianism, the origins of totalitarianism, that the, 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 the mob who follow fascism refuse to believe their eyes and ears and believe only their imagination. And Karl Mannheim writes something very similar in uh, Utopia and Ideology about the, the role of mad, uh, crazed irrationalism in, in, in the process of adoption of fascism. So just a quick run through before I conclude about what I think the, the features of the modern fascist ideology are. I th I've reduced it to, I've got five bullet points here on my manual uh, PowerPoint. Um, and number one is the great replacement theory. The allegation that inward migration is a form of genocide against the white race. Hopefully people on this call understand where that came from, what it is, and its parallels with, with previous forms of scientific racism. Point two, and this is new, it's not, if, if the refugees, migrants, and Muslims are enemy number one for fascism, enemy number one A is feminism, and indeed liberated women. And, and that, that means that route number one A into fascism, and a very effective route, is violent misogyny, which I think is a difference from the 1930s. Um, point three is, as with, uh, you know, as in the 1930s, Somebody has to be behind this. Somebody is behind the invasion of our continent by invaders and the collaboration with them by feminists, human rights lawyers, and liberals. So liberals are also very, very heavily otherized in the new fascism. Um, who's behind it? Cultural Marxism. So point three is there is always a perpetrator. And just as in the Kultur Bolshevismus in the 1930s, that's heavily associated with both Jews and uh, obviously the existing left. And this new mythologized creature in the modern fascist ideology, the social justice warrior, the SJW. They are the carrier of the disease of cultural Marxism. Point four, what do you do about it? Well, you don't storm, uh, you, you don't march on Rome, you don't march out of a beer keller in Munich. Um, you probably don't, uh, if you're thinking clearly, um, storm the US Capitol. What you do is you, you prepare. Large numbers of far right activists are actively involved in preparing for something. And the preparation could involve, as last year, 
uh, was busted, uh, the Nordkreuz movement in, in northern Germany, um, 25 or 30 ex-cops, ex-military, ex they had a 25,000 strong death list drawn up from police computers. And while you're preparing, what you engage in, I think, and this is one of the, I've spent some, some time discussing this in detail in the book, is symbolic violence. All the case studies I've used in the book, all drawn from 2020, are examples of where the far right has engaged with right-wing populist periphery and deluded recently radicalized people to, to perpetrate symbolic violence, violence that tells a story and indeed tells the story I'm just recounting point, points one to three. The final point is this, what are they waiting for? It's variously described, you know, the storm, day X, um, the deluge. Um, they're waiting for the cataclysmic breakdown of Western uh, democracy, um, after which they intend to create a world of, as Carl Schmitt put it, you know, uh, large areas governed by single gov governments with, uh, with homogeneous populations. Uh, in other words, they're unlike the kind of standard uh, Sturmabteilung member in 1929, genocide and world war is, is really overt in their agenda. And you, there's an example I use in the book of, you know, um, some hacked uh, web chats from Discord channels uh, used by far right gamers of 150,000 examples, 15,000 talked about genocide. Genocide's high in the mix. So that's point five, the global ethnic civil war resulting in ethnic monostates. Now, what do, we, what do we do? First of all, I think we have to recognize that makes fascism quite a different beast. It is interacting and using an, um, and using a kind, as a kind of willing host, both right-wing populist movements and even authoritarian conservative parties. And the number one example is unfortunately the most important authoritarian conservative party in the world, the Republican Party. Um, this party is headed overtly and willingly down the route of becoming a host to fascism and an enabler of, of an authoritarian state, which I think we could see as early as 2024. Um, so that to, to my, to my non-reviewers at the FT and, and, and other newspapers, that's why you should care. Um, what else is different? It's this fascism has no Mein Kampf. If you wanted to get a new idea into Mein Kampf, as, as, uh, as Robert Dare did with the green fascism in the late 20s, um, you had to apply to a man called Hitler. Modern fascism is using networks to co-create itself. You just copy and paste everything and add your own little idea and pass it on. This makes it very, very mercurial. And, and why, why I think it's better to write about the ideological core than to continually keep try to keep rushing after it uh, to document its, its, morph, its, its morphology. It's, it's, it's changing very, very rapidly as a set of ideas. The importance of anti-feminism and violent misogyny is this. Most racists, violent racists, have fantasized about physically attacking uh, a, a black person or a Muslim, but, but not many have done it. Every violent misogynist has hit a woman. And when a racist says, uh, a black person took my job or a migrant took my job, often that's just not true. When a violent misogynist or beta or incel says, a woman is above me in the social hierarchy, it, it possibly is true because we, we've, we've experienced 50 years of um, technological reproductive shock, as Janet Yellen puts it, um, as a result of, 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 um, of access to reproductive rights. I also think that what is very central to it, and this is one of the only advantages being 61, of having fought a fascism that was different, um, very central to it is performative self-deception. What, what Mannheim observed among the German Nazis, early in German Nazis, this, this folkloric, mytholo mythologized life that many of them live is, is something new. And I think it's got to, we've got to seek both academic and sociological and behavioral scientific explanations for it, and then ways out for it. And to finish, what to do is the easy bit. Because as I argue in the book, you know, if, if as Arendt said, fascism was, or, Nazism was an, a temporary alliance of the elite and the mob. 
The only thing that defeated it in the 30s was a temporary alliance of the center and the left. The French Popular Front I use as a template, actually. Um, now, this is usually um, problematic, on, especially on the British left. The first thing you learn when you start learning about workers' history is how, how terrible the Popular Fronts were and what a mistake they were. But the fact is that the French Popular Front not only dismantled the, the, the leagues, the, the armed and, and, and uh, militarized leagues, and unleashed the biggest moment of class struggle in French history, but it also, and I think this is where, where I think we should study it more, it unleashed a cultural movement and a moral philosophical movement, uh, which, I, which I think there's a strong argument to say is, was the movement that, that unified European de democracy after the, uh, during the war and created the conditions for the post-war settlement. Anti-fascism became something bigger than socialism, communism, and, um, uh, and liberalism. Um, I'm a big advocate of anti-fascist laws, again, making myself unpopular with the Leninist left, which always says, you know, we don't want the state to be empowered because it will probably attack us. Well, that, that's a risk. But again, I think, you know, the Proud Boys are banned in Canada, free to operate in America. As a result, Canada doesn't have a problem of one of its most liberal cities being regularly invaded and, 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 and violence perpetrated against minorities by the Proud Boys. Uh, Portland, Oregon does. Um, and I think the German anti-fascist law should be the model. The final point I'll make is we need an anti-fascist ethos. Trump went out of his way to try and stigmatize and indeed criminalize the idea of Antifa, of anti-fascism. We've got to, my book, I'm you know, making a point, it's the first book I've written where I think to myself, at a certain point on the, say, on the district line in London, or in certain pubs from the town, town I come from, Lee in Lancashire, am I going to get it out? Uh, and the answer is yes, because I don't think our, our grandfathers and grandmothers' generation endured what they endured in the Second World War and the price some of them paid for it, for us to go around skulking, pretend, sort of uh, allowing it to be a disputed question whether or not we, the left and the liberal um, intelligentsia in Britain, are allowed to be publicly anti-fascist. And there's quite a lot in the book about, as there was in my last book, about the lacuna of moral philosophical thinking on the British left and indeed among liberals, uh, which I want to remedy. With that, I'll shut up. Thank you. Listen, thank you very much for that um, set of introductory comments. And as I say, we're going to now turn to a sort of conversation, I think, um, between Leia, Upi and Paul. And so I think I'll just turn over to you, Leia, to do that. I guess we'll do that for about you know, up, to up to 20 minutes, something like that. Uh, OK, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here and to Paul for writing this great book. Uh, so Paul's book is called How to Stop Fascism, and in a way the mission is exactly that, to stop fascism and to help us stop fascism. But uh, in order to stop fascism, we have to be convinced that it's there. And to be convinced that it's there, we have to be able to see it. And to be able to see it, we have to have the conceptual categories that enable us to identify what we see as fascism. And so in a way, what Paul's book does is to precisely tell us a story as to how to recognize what we see as fascism, which delves into the intellectual roots of the phenomenon, then gives us a history of how this phenomenon manifests itself at a particular point in time and triggers certain forces. And, uh, and then there is a sort of third part, which is called resistance, which in a way draws the lessons from these first two parts for the present. So I have some questions about each of these uh, three parts of the book. I have one question, maybe one or two questions about each of them. So one on ideology, one on history and one on resistance. But before that, I guess I have a more sort of general meta question that might come up to anyone who takes this book and wants to read it and is clearly concerned by what they see around them. So violence and fear and clear rise of authoritarianism a clear return to a sense of hierarchy and conservative values, attachment to ethnicity, you know, trends that are very concerning of misogyny and racism, anti-immigration and so on. So there are a range of phenomena that we see out there in the contemporary world that concern us. But the skeptic might say, and this is why this is a meta question, why does it matter that these phenomena are called fascism? Yeah. 
they could be a variant of conservatism, just as fascism is a variant of conservatism, which materializes at a particular point in time historically and takes a particular historical configuration and uh, sets in motion particular political and social forces and takes, you know, the, has the fortune that it has. And so it's a version of conservatism. And now we might be confronted with another version of conservatism, which could be worse than the one, for all we know, than the one that we call fascism. And that might be called something completely different yeah. that just is not fascism. So the first question, I guess, which is a sort of meta question is, why does it matter that what we see is fascism as opposed to something else which might be even more dangerous than fascism and to which we might give a different name, whatever that name would be. And so my question is, is it, do we want to call it fascism because what we see really is the same thing? Or do we want to call it fascism because even though these things are not quite the same thing and you do in the book often highlight the differences between these phenomena, the different forms they take and so on, it's politically and strategically important for us to recognize these uh, phenomena as fascism. Mm -hmm. And because then we can kind of mobilize what we have learned from our experience of fascism and we can uh, more easily mobilize people politically against these current threats. And I think it's sort of important to, to clarify that difference, I think. So that's a sort of more generic question. Yeah. So um, I have no problem with uh, historians like the, the late Tim Mason, no relation to me, uh, who is the, probably the most eminent Marxist historian of, of fascism in, in the UK, who, who really said, look, if you want to use this term fascism, he wrote an essay said, it's called whatever happened to fascism, the, the concept. Um, he said, if you want to use this term, it can only be used in a very sparingly comparative way historically between, say, the NSDAP and the, the National Fascist Party. You, you've got to be very sparing. I've got no problem with that as a historical discipline. Uh, issue. Uh, you, if, that, if that is the, the approach you want to take, it produced in Tim's case the some of the greatest uh, historic historical writing about the German working class. The, pro the problem we are confronting is is a is is a political one of practice. Now, I would say, um, I take the view that what we are seeing is a recurrence. Um, now, why is that important? Because, you know, some very eminent historians and indeed many people sort of my age and above, their, their, working, their working hypothesis was that never again was a, was a statement of fact, not, not an aspiration, um, that we were not going to see the reemergence of genocidal ideation, uh, that we were not going to see the reemergence of, um, of systematic um, irrationalism and pseudoscience and race, racist science. But we have... And it, 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 my sources in this, I'm a heterodox Marxist in this sense, are, are I think two of the, the great thinkers about fascism, Gramsci and Wilhelm Reich. Gramsci's earliest intuition about fascism was something that I want to cling to. And that is that it's not um, a party that we're, or a movement that we're trying to define uh, rather in the way that, that post-structuralist historians have done. It is a process. And it's a process of social breakdown. So that's the first thing I want to cling to. Um, this, and the process of social breakdown, you, you call it, you say, Leia, um, it, it might be just a recurrence of something that happened to conservatism. Well, yes, that's true. Uh, but as Zeev Sternhell pointed out in his work on French fascism, it, it was, fascism was always more than conservatism because it was, the, it was, the, it was the, and Nolte actually points this out as well. It's the concern, it's the despair and militarization and, and plebeian mass detonation of all the themes in 19th century conservatism under the impact of something bad happening to conservatism, which is in a way it becoming impossible to achieve. Um, and um, that's why both Nolte and Reich, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, alighted on essentially on the same concept that fascism's main driver is the fear of freedom or the fear of transcendence as Nolte calls it um driven by the sudden realization that freedom is is imminent and possible and likely and uh, a group in society which you know you can define it variously either you know, Reich tends to talk about the family and the hierarchy and German militarism Nolte talks about uh, a group within society that that is like the Praetorian Guard, the, the, the ex-soldier, the ex-cop, uh, ex the cop indeed, 
Um, so I want to cling to the idea that th this is a process and it can be historically repeated because many of the features we are seeing are not only objectively repeating what happened, you know, the mass irrationalism, the militarization of politics, the sudden emergence of genocidal um, theory, themes and theories, but so not only can it theoretically be repeated, but it, it is being repeated. Um, the, the thing that, the points you raise about, well, we, we could indeed come up with a, a, a complete other theoretical framework, and, and many of the, the, the philosophers of, uh, and, and political scientists who study political religion would indeed argue that that's the framework. I want to argue that a, a revised and updated and improved Marxist theory of fascism is in, can indeed explain this, this, this thing that's happening. It's the detonation of a very fragile um, self. You know, it's, it's, it's the detonation of a of a, a disintegration of a self-image among large numbers of people that underlies it. And that, again, to finish, Arendt argued in 1945 that those who said Ge Nazism was the, was the product of the German character were completely wrong. She argued it was the disintegration of the German character that had triggered it. I argue, both in this book and my last one, Clear Bright Future, that what we're seeing is the disintegration of the neoliberal character, the typical self created in the 1990s to 2008. And that allows us to legitimately argue that we are seeing a recurrence of something that is more deeply rooted than just in sort of the, the class dynamics of the 1930s or post-1918 militarism, uh, etc. So that's my basic argument on that. Look, I just quickly jump in to say um, th there's so much rich material here, but if we want to get a number of questions in, <laughs> I think both the questions and the answers need to oh, be sorry. slightly more succinct. I mean, Leah suggested she had between three and six questions, and at that, at that rate, we're not going to get through it. So I think it would be nice to hear some of those questions. So perhaps if we can just try and tighten it up. Yeah, yeah. thanks. So shall I go ahead with my... Please go ahead with your next question. All right, so I'll, I'll stick to three questions, one for each part of the book, which would, would be the sure. real questions. The other one was a meta question. It was an intro to the questions. So this one, so I have a question about ideology, as I said, one about history and one about resistance. The question about ideology is the following. So Paul says, and I think this is one of the most interesting and stimulating parts of the book, when he traces the sort of intellectual roots of fascism. He says that central to the ideology of fascism is the critique of modernity, and more specifically, this kind of an enlightenment idea <clears throat> of reason, and this sort of idea that reason stands above emotion and progress, universal human rights, and so on. And so there is a kind of common anti-rationalist core to fascist thought, which harks back to a lot of you know, conservative critiques of the enlightenment, romantic critiques of the French Revolution. And, so, and I, I found that very interesting, very stimulating. And Paul has very interesting pages where he talks about Nietzsche and how Nietzsche's idea of will to power can then translate into this fascist understanding of violence and the importance of violence. But what I wanted to ask is this. So this, uh, the disruption of that apparatus, so the, the critique of reason, the destruction of reason, as Lukács puts it, is not unique to um, conservative thought. No. There is a sense in which in the contemporary political theory panorama, at least, there's a number of other theories ranging from, you know, critiques of Western centrist liberal political theory to post-colonialism, to comparative politics, to comparative political theory, which come from a very different corner and all of which highlight in the same way how this sort of problematic aspects of this narrative of rationality which has been mobilized by liberals and has been put to the service of, you know, dominating imperial yeah. projects and so on. So while I'm really sympathetic with the kind of the, where Paul is coming from intellectually and with this idea that there's something to this destruction of reason that generates these political outcomes, I wanted to ask you, how can we disentangle on the one hand, this kind of critique of this idea of rationality, and on the other hand, the way in which this idea of rationality has actually been appropriated and put to the service of liberal ends and to generate from that a critique of liberalism, which might also serve anti-fascist goals. So that's yeah. sort of ideology question. It's Second question is about um, history. And so the, the main sort of lesson that I think I took from, you know, from Paul's interesting and exhaustive study and explanation of how these fascist movements rise in Germany and, and in Italy and how they prevail 
uh, you know, the circumstances that enable and so on, is the question that Paul raises at the end of that part, which is, why did the left fail to stop fascism? And for me, although I found the answer to that question interesting, for me, the question is not why did the left fail to stop fascism? It's why did liberals end up allying with fascism in the end when push came to shove? And I felt that there was something in the book which was the, the move was very much to criticize the sort of what you say is the, the orthodox Marxist take and the, you know, the inability of orthodox Marxists to kind of grasp the complexity of forces in play and that there is a sort of economic reductionism which didn't uh, enable them to, to tackle these phenomena in the right way and so on. But again, I think there is too much in the book on why the left failed on, this, on, on its own terms and not enough on why the liberal elites ended up siding with these forces. And, uh, and you know, when you say Marxists didn't predict fascism, I think, well, they didn't predict it because they considered it a variation of Bonapartism. Mm. And so how do we know that what we have now is not, you know, a variation of Bonapartism, but rather fascism? And uh, why, you know, why are you so confident that actually fascism really is something different compared to the phenomena that is yeah. described as the sort of manipulation by uh, liberal elites of these right wing forces, which in the end get out of control. And so that's the sort of question. And the, uh, the last question I have is about resistance and the uh, idea which I'm really sympathetic to, to of the suggestion of a sort of new popular front that can counter the rise of fascism and that takes this form of this alliance between the reformist and revolutionary wings in a way of, of the left, which can form a common bloc. But I don't want to sound pessimistic, but I just want to highlight three very quick things that make the contemporary situation very different. So the first one is that mass parties in the popular front really were mass parties. In other words, representation in some ways worked. Democratic representation works. Mass parties uh, were there. They performed this representative role. They represented people in parliament. Elections in some ways were representative. So mass parties hadn't turned into the kind of cartel parties that we're familiar with right now. And so that might be one difference. The second difference is that the scope for national maneuver back then was much larger than it is now. And so, you know, states didn't try to solve prizes by just borrowing money and so raising the stakes kind of financially. The, the, the tools that they had available were very different, which meant that there was much more that could be done with domestic politics. And therefore, these national fronts, with, with popular fronts, which were national fronts, could mobilize nationally. And the third one was that we didn't have institutions, transnational institutions that played such a large role as you know the EU, for example, does right now, which also have to be incorporated in political decision making. So I feel like if we're trying to revive a model like the national, the popular front, we need to say a little bit more on what the scope of these alliances should be, whether they should be national or international, how they should target national institutions and how whether they should try and modify domestic laws or increase representation at the international level and so on. So and then the final question that I have, which is actually the biggest question I have about the book <laughs> uh, in general, I want to know exactly how you think about the link between capitalism and fascism. And I don't want to be pedantic, Paul, but I will quote two bits in your book, which I think pull in different directions. So there is a part in the introduction in which you say, will we have, and this is a quote from Paul Mays, will we have to go on defeating fascism over and over again until capitalism departs? And you say the answer is yes, which suggests that in a way the struggle against fascism is part of the kind of larger struggle against capitalism. So this is from the introduction. But then in page 69, you say, as with climate change, again, quote, it's possible to imagine a capitalism that achieves system-wide change and promotes social responsibility, but not this capitalism. And there, the choice seems to be between different forms of capitalism. Yeah. So it kind of matters for me to know where you stand on this question. Is the struggle against fascism at one with the struggle against capitalism? Or will we go on having these crises that enable these sort of fascist or neo-fascist or however you want to call them actors to emerge because of the contradictions of capital that sort of go through this cyclical period. So you get social democracy, then the tensions of social democracy produce the rise of uh, you know, austerity, then austerity produces neoliberal uh, po politics and economics, which in turn produces dissatisfaction. So this, and we know about this, you know, Hobbes von calls and Kondratiev cycles. It's a sort of familiar phenomenon. So, you know, unless you have a clear answer to that, it's going to be very hard to make progress with, you know, specific proposals yeah. because the, the proposal will be very different. So. Well, yeah, I'll just okay. 
Let me just try and summarize. So there's four questions on the table, and I don't know whether you can do one every two minutes. I can, I can do there's one line. There's a question about left and right critiques of rationality. Yep. And there's a question about is it left failure or is it liberal complicity? There's a third question about whether contemporary conditions mean a popular front isn't so easy. And then a big fourth question yeah, about yeah. the relationship between capital. I've got it, and I've been taking notes, Leah. You'll be glad to say I'll be a very good student in one of your lectures. Um, so I'll just try and give one line answers. I can't substantiate them because I'd rather hear from, from the audience some, some of their points of view. But look, for, yes, I mean, £350, uh, the £350 price tag on Domenico Losurdo's book about Nietzsche, it's still going to be very money well spent for anybody who wants to engage in this debate. Because I think, uh, for me, I want to have an argument with um, not so much the orthodox hard left Marxists who I interact with in the Labour Party, but there's a generation of young people who've taken a kind of pick and mix approach between Marxism and postmodernism and kind of say, oh, I'd like a bit of this and I like a bit of that as well. And I just don't think it's possible. I think I stand on the side of Marxism that is humanist, that stands in the tradition of the Tom Thompson's critique of uh, Althusser. And, and I think it's uh, that that critique informs my critique of postmodernism and post-structuralism. I think that um, therefore we do have to defend the enlightenment and we have to defend rational, rationality, um, not rationalism. And part of it is about defending it in a, in a rich and, um, and a, a kind of rich and complex way against people like Steven Pinker and the whole bunch of liberal rationalists who, who are, are basically Panglossians, you know, the, the world, you know, the, what is rational is real, what is real is rational, therefore Blairism and, and Bill Clinton were the high point of Western civilization. So yes, of course we attack them, but we, I just don't buy any, to be honest, any of the post-Nietzschean, Foucauldian left arguments. They're not standing up very well, actually. They're not a real bulwark against fascism. We could go into greater detail. I'm sure that many people violently disagree with me here. As to the post-colonial, non-Western emergent traditions in, 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 in global progressive thought, I'm far more open to them. Because, because th what, what they, that, for example, the Aimé Césaire, Césaire critique of, of um, the famous you know, shocking comment that, you know, um, fascism was colonialism done to Europe, I think is a great starting point for a study. So, so that, that, that squares off that question. History. Why, why wasn't it just a form of Bonapartism? I'm very critical of the unorthodox Marxist, Trotsky, Talheimer, Gramsci included. What, what, they were all obsessed with Bonapartism because it was, they were looking for a model of fascism in 19th century reality, when indeed, it, it had, and, and Gramsci intuitively moves towards this in his 1921 article, Elemental Forces. He says, this is a phenomenon that can only partly be explained through class forces. Now for a Marxist to say that begs the question, which he never answered, what are the other forces? What are the non-class forces? Uh, it goes back to your thing about, about the recurrence. For me, it is rooted in something deeper than than capitalist society, it is certainly rooted in, as Reich suggested, in the in the repressions and the hierarchies, and indeed the subconscious created um, in human beings by at least forty thousand years of of different forms of class society. That's the mistake Orthodox Marxism makes when it just wants to situate fascism in the dynamics of imperialist capitalism. It's it's something more. So on that, and for example, you know someone I don't agree with, but the tradition of Althusser and Paul Ansas, who were trying to call almost mathematically map out how fascism and fascist middle class movements achieved a kind of autonomy from the class forces that created them is a worthwhile uh, thing to do. Although I think some of, I think Paul Ansas is better than Althusser on this. Resistance. Yeah, you're absolutely right, Leah. Yeah, you know, if, if, if we had to defeat the old kind of fascism with what we have now, we'd be very, very unfortunate because, you know, there are no mass parties, room for uh, national manoeuvre is small because of globalisation, and we've got transnational institutions and indeed a transnational fascism. But I do think we have the basis for something 
to resist it. And for me, the, the essence of what the Popular Front was, wasn't simply an agreement between mass parties. Very important for the French Popular Front was the local committees which dissolved mass party affiliations, the CVIA, the Committee of, of Intellectuals, which existed in every uh, town and was what they meant by intellectuals was just that teachers were allowed to join, it wasn't all factory workers. Um, and I think anti-fascism as a cultural movement and the Popular Front as a cultural movement, I'm very influenced by uh, Julian Jackson's uh, historical work on this, I think is something we just need to learn from. If we, I think we can create in the modern world a cultural movement and we don't need mass parties, just the way we don't need mass parties to do politics. Yes, we've got these clientist neoliberal model marketized parties, but we can also create horizontal and diagonal mass movements that can achieve mass very quickly. I mean, both Black Lives Matter in Britain and the Gaza demonstrations in Britain in the last two years have achieved a, a mass and a scale that, uh, that I think are very underestimated by the political sort of establishment. They don't realize how big both those movements were. Um, finally, to your point, um, uh, 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 about capitalism. Uh, is there a contradiction? He, I would argue not. What I'm arguing ab uh, about, what I'm saying in the thing about the next 10 years is climate change, to, to achieve next net zero, we're going to have to do it under capitalism. I don't think we're going to uh, disestablish the mode of production in 10 years, but it has, has to be a very different form of capitalism that is decarbonized. Andreas Malm is right, you know, that Capitalism is 250 years of, of, of fossil fuel extraction um, is, is going to find it very difficult to adapt to non-fossil fuel extraction. But that is my answer to that. As to is, cap, is fascism only rooted in, in either this form of capitalism or capitalism itself, I just think it's rooted in something deeper. And that's the lesson I wanted to try and or the argument I wanted to try and have with still so many activists who cling to the Dimitrov 1935 definition of fascism as if it is in some way true or has been vindicated by any form of action taken guided by it because neither are the case. It is neither real nor did it guide any form of successful action. Thank you very much and uh, thank you for trying to deal with a lot of issues um, quickly and thank you for raising such a lot of interesting issues um Leia. i've got a number of questions here i'm going to try and get through at least a few of them um so the first one i'm going to put to you paul and then maybe at the end if if Leia wants to make some comments after we've done a few of them maybe that would be a good thing to do too so the first one says you mentioned 2008 what role have events like the financial crisis and the pressure of globalization more generally had putting the uh, working class put what has the pressure of globalization on the working class had done to stimulate modern day fascism how much of the modern trend is rooted in global economics okay so 2008 and globalization yeah, well look we've got um <coughs> I, i'll just give a very personal anecdote the, the tone i come from lee in lancashire um you know was something like um liberal throughout the 19th century, Labour from 1921 onwards, went conservative two years ago, quite decisively as well. Um, in the process of that happening, here's what happened. Out of nowhere, around about 2004-05, um, British National Party um, <coughs> voting started in council elections. No activism, no branch. There, there has, has not been a branch of BMP in that town. It's a very close-knit working class town. BMP got something like 5% in the vote of the vote out of nowhere. Then UKIP got 20%. So at the moment, so when the BMP had a million votes, they were getting 5% in, in Lee. When UKIP had 4 million votes, they were getting 20% in Lee. And then what happened is that the UKIP vote folded into the existing middle class conservative vote. And um, that created the situation where in the 2019 election, the Labour MP went on the streets for one and a half hours throughout the entire campaign because she was, to, frankly, too frightened to do anything else. Um, his, the whole party was beleaguered with a and, and subsumed in a level of um, right wing, ultra right wing, populist and fascist um, sort of insults and hostility to the point where it couldn't function. Um, 
No, that's not the same as squadrism in 1921. It's not the same as marching in and ripping up the banners and all the rest of it the way that, that they did. But everything that I've just described is traceable to the collapse of the working class lifestyle in which I grew up. Leia's book, which comes out later this month, describes a, a parallel but interestingly similar experience of the collapse of a civilization. Neoliberalism hit my town with the force of, of a tsunami of civilizational collapse to the point of where people are saying to you openly, I want to round up all the Romanians and take them to the port of Dover in a van. Um, so that's the answer. Neoliberalism created a self, created a self image, created a, a story of success that wasn't very happy for people in my town. They preferred Keynesianism. But when that collapsed, there's nothing left. There's no ideological um, or indeed psychological, I would argue, uh, coherence to the life they're supposed to live. And so I think it's entirely traceable to the ideological rather than the direct economic impacts of neoliberalism's rise and then collapse. So there's another question now from Ulysses Coulon uh, asking about France, given that the French presidential elections are on the horizon. What do you think of the rise of Eric Zemmour today? Yeah. What can be done about it and what can we learn from this case? So, so Zemmour is, I think, interesting because Marine Le Pen constructed a right wing populism to hoover up the anti austerity uh, and anti neoliberal um, hostility of, of provincial and small town French working class people. Uh, and of course, their Islamophobia. Um, and that, that, in other words, was a kind of almost successful right wing, wing populism. But what Zemmour has done, if you think about my five points great replacement, anti feminism, anti cultural Marxism. Uh, symbolic violence or symbolic violent speech, and then allusions to genocide. That is the spine of Zemmour's politics. Now, Zemmour is a very litigious person, so we'll just be careful about what we say about him on this podcast. But, um, but, but Zemmour, in other words, has taken that thought architecture of the new far right and, and weaponized it in a way, weirdly, that Le Pen hasn't. So I think that... Um, it is also the case, and the FT did a very good feature on this about a month ago, that there is a fascosphere in France on the online, on TikTok and on Instagram, where everything you hear in, in the American far right fascist network uh, space is also there. So, so, so I think I'm afraid that you know they're not that comrade Jean Luc Mélenchon and his buddies need to get real uh, unlike last time there can be no messing around and talk of abstention if we end up with with Macron or a Republican in the final runoff against uh, either Zemmour or Le, Le Pen the, the, the popular front 101 is we need to seize control of the fight against those fascists or, or those far right uh, and far right wing populist uh, leaders from the liberals who are doing it ineffectively but the idea of boycotting it is, is just bizarre. Thank you. So now we have a question from Charlie Mansell, who says that in the 1920s, fascists learned a lot from the organisational efforts of revolutionary communists. What is influencing the structural development of fascism today? Is it just an internet or social media driven phenomenon? Or are there other organisational influences from which it draws? Well, look, we must understand the weaponized power of social media. Um, you know, Biology teachers in Brazil who had taught the same class for decades in 2018 suddenly had kids standing up at the back of the class saying, I I'm sick of all this Marxist uh, propaganda you're teaching us. The world was created in seven days. The world is 3000 years old. Vaccines are a form of uh, genocide against white people. All of that. An investigation by the New York Times showed that what had happened was that the YouTube algorithm had drawn every discontent <laughs> and every form of anger together and, and, and vectored it towards some of the most impressionable people. So when we talk about networks, uh, networks and sort of and now empowering and enabling the new far right. It's not the network sitting there passively where everyone's just a passive node on it, though it is that it allows them to to form swarms and swarm against targets and around issues. It is the fact that we have the biggest, the eight out of the 10 biggest corporations in the world, their business model is to, to weaponize and mobilize anger for, for gain. And so it, it's, it's that 
And so I think reg regulation of those companies, um, as well as education of people about networks, and I think even personal vigilance. If you have a, a young male family member who is playing online computer games, they will be exposed to the, that culture of incel, beta rebellion, beta insurrection, um, casual uh, references to violent misogyny, rape culture. It's all out there. And that is a route to the far right that, that many people don't probably understand. Even now, about five, six years, seven years after Gamergate, they don't understand how, how, what a kind of, what a pipeline that is to the, to the edges of the far right, where you can then take the choice. Do you want to believe the whole thing, the whole conspiracy theory and, 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 and weaponized hatred? Uh, and the people who monitor this, the interesting thing they point out is that it, it doesn't matter what the source of the anger is. After 9-11, it was Islamophobia. After 2008, it was anti-austerity or anti-elite, anti-global elite, anti-new anti anti world order, anti-world economic forum. Um, those who monitor it in real time are telling me right now, the trans issue, uh, anti-trans and anti-gender politics is one of the most uh, common routes for people into far-right uh, ideological networks. Thanks. Um, look, uh, I'm, I'm going to try and get in a couple more questions, yeah, yeah. Um, and we, we can go on maybe five minutes longer or something. I think it would be worth it to get in a few more questions. And then I'm going to ask uh, Leia if she wants to comment and then give you a chance, Paul, at the end to comment on all of the comments briefly uh, before we summarise it. So here's another question. It's from Tully Rector in Utrecht University. And um, the questioner asks, how compatible are the interests of capital in its most powerful concentrations at present, hedge funds and other players in the financial sector, multinational organisations, et cetera? How compatible are they uh, with the interests of fascist movements, which you discuss in your book? Well, look, that's why the, the Dimitrov um, definition is, is, is pretty useless to us. Um, there is no wing of, of financial capital, Western financial capital, that wants or needs fascism. There are, and the, there are individuals who've gone on a journey from libertarianism to authoritarianism, like Peter Thiel, who in 2009, you know, the founder of PayPal and the owner of Palantir, who in 2009 said, I no longer believe freedom and democracy are compatible. Okay. So, but what has happened rather is that just as in Germany in the, in the early 30s, the, the, the global bourgeoisie is split between a kind of keep going with globalization, um, probably a bit less because to, to maintain um, consent, and, and a group like Trump, like Orban, like Duda in, in Poland, uh, like, like the, the backers of Marine Le Pen, who, who see globalization as being an end, see global, the world economy as, as, a, as a zero or negative sum game and want now to, I, I call it neoliberalism, neoliberal nationalism or Thatcherism in one country. The neoliberal project refocused around the nation state and therefore around international competition through trade, through uh, you know, all the things that Trump did, trade, rhetoric, uh, war, um, et cetera. Now, in that sense, um, fascism is absolutely aligned. All forms of the far right are absolutely aligned with those that faction of the global bourgeoisie that wants to retreat to a national or block centric, sovereignty centric uh, form of capitalism. And, and the question for the next 10 years is, is, and of course they love it, that Trump loves to have a fascist base that he can call to the streets, that can uh, go on uh, and sort of dox and harass and, and, and uh, uh, insult you know, the minorities, et cetera. Um, the question is, absolutely the same as with you know Kurt Schleicher or Alfred Hugenberg in Germany do we come to a point where the the big bourgeois uh right-wing populists um, and authoritarians lose control of this thing that they think they currently control that is that and that is a question of struggle Thanks. Look, I'm just going to amalgamate two questions into one, and then I'm going to turn to Professor Upi. Um, they both deal with things that you started your talk about in a way about the, what the phenomenon is. So Ursula Zemek asks, 
What to speak? What do you think about the overusing of the word fascism when referring to parties such as UKIP, segments of the Tory Party, and so on? Is it devaluing the meaning of the word? Another questioner, Alastair Rudd, asks, "What sort of fascism is Viktor Orbán producing in Hungary?" So, if you could just comment on that, and then I'll I'll turn to um, Leia. Well, if we look at Hungary, Viktor Orbán is not a fascist. Trump is not a fascist. Farage, despite what his own teacher said was is not a fascist his modus operandi doesn't conform to any definition that that anybody would around this table would 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 want to use but the problem is if we go back to the you know, there is of the historians there is to me only one robert o paxton who who basically captures the the dialectic of fascism which is that it is a process it is a social a process as gramsci says of social disintegration and people like orban uh salvini uh, Trump and Farage are products of the process, even though they are not themselves fascist. The point is that they can that they can become and have become, I would argue, certainly with Trump and the Republican Party, a willing enabler of the fascist radicalization process. And that's the situation that we are in. I know the, the, the other um, the just the, the other part of the question was uh, was. Um, just is it is it reasonable to call UKIP and yeah. so on? I mean, in a way, you've commented on it. Yeah, yeah. I, I have, uh, but I think uh, you know, we I wouldn't overuse that, and I would be I would caution people against it. There's, there's a, a weirdly polarized debate with some historian Richard Evans saying you can only say fascism was the product of the traumatized men in the 1920s after World War One, and then other people, you know, some American academics wanting to say that you know Trump is a fascist oid, etc. I'd rather say. I, I'm, you know, definitions are not explanations. And, uh, you know, if, if we were, you know, having a methodological social scientific argument, that would be the starting point of it. Um, for me, um, to, to the description of processes, the, the typo, we need a typology of the fascist process. Now, try to do that in the book is how we approach judging things like, look, Hugenberg's DNVP the German National People's Party, 14% of the vote, collapsed almost completely el electorally into the Nazi party by 1932. His votes were moving that way. Six months after the Hitler seizure of power, Hugenberg voluntarily dissolved his party into the fascist state. Um, so what do we make of a figure like Karl Schmitt? What do we make, make of figures like Hugenberg? They willingly became fascists as soon as it was nice to do so. So we mustn't we can have the definitions, but we must understand that real people move very rapidly from one to another in, in the historical examples that we have. Thank you very much for fielding a wide range of questions. I'm going to turn now to Leia Uppi uh, to see what okay, she would I'll like to say about this one. <laughs> I'll just say a couple of things that might, might be slightly different from uh, what Paul said about the relationship between capitalism and fascism, just because I think that's sort of where, for me at least, the sort of the heart of the matter is. And I, I think I'm sympathetic to a lot of the things that, that Paul says, but I want to say two things. So if we were to make a parallel between our circumstances and the circumstances in the 20s, 30s, I would say that fascism arises under circumstances in which you have a crisis of representation, so a crisis of democracy, and a financial crisis, an economic yeah. crisis. And where, you know, there is a sense in which liberal elites and fascist movements collude to discipline a very powerful anti-system movement, which is, you know, real, and we know it's real because it's already taken power in Russia and they know it themselves and so on. So I think if I were uh, to answer this question that was asked earlier about what is the relationship between capitalism and, and fascism, and Paul said, well, I don't think, you know, there's no wing of Western financial capital that wants or needs fascism. I would say, well, they may not want it or need it now because the threat from the left is not powerful enough. So if there is a real anti-systemic movement that actually really fundamentally threatens the existence of these financial companies, then I think they would actually both want it and need it because they would find themselves unable to stop this sort of very strong anti-system movement. And they would just as in the past end up colluding, not necessarily because they like these guys, but because these are you know, the guys that can do the, the dirty work on their behalf. And so I would say that it's a question of sort of how interests mobilize and, and come together and channel certain political forces that make them more or less vulnerable to, to colluding with fascist movements. And that's where it becomes really dangerous. So paradoxically, I think fascism is only really strong when the left or the sort of anti-system, anti-capitalist movements are really strong. And if they're not, 
sufficiently strong, then they can be symbolic, they can be more there as a sort of threat, they can be lurking in the background, and but that, you know, they're not really fundamentally to be taken seriously, I think. And the second thing I wanted to say is about actually the, the relationship between financial crisis and capitalism. And this is another part of, I guess, one of my more sort of skeptical remarks on why, you know, it's not enough to think and call for a kind of popular front that can make compromises when it comes to, you know, climate change or social policies or social democracies and so on. Because we know that what brought the financial crisis, so what brought neoliberalism is actually the collapse of old fashioned good old, you know, welfare state social democracy, which we all like because it's great and it's much better than neoliberalism and so on. But it did also have its own problems because if you didn't have those problems then you wouldn't have had neoliberalism. So it seems to me that when we think about sort of alternatives to the system or when we think about taming the system and so on, we really do need to go beyond in terms of both policy prescriptions and political strategy and political orientation. We do need to go beyond some of these recipes of you know, welfare states, democracy, national democracy and so on, and to really be able to kind of conceptualize the system both beyond national boundaries, but also beyond the kind of political economic constraints that we, that we currently face. And I think that the left is really not up to task on that front because yeah. it's severely divided on exactly this matter. So first, what is the scope of the struggle? And second, the fact that you need to be very, very clear about what you're arguing for and what you're defending and what's your political orientation, basically. So, Paul, some final thoughts. Well, uh, thank you for that, Leah. And I think that, um, yeah, I would, yeah, look, the, the, German, the German left party just bombed in the, in the German election because um, it, more than half of its supporters are green, sponty, liberal, socially liberal people who live in squats in Berlin or ex-squatters. And one of its leading figures says women should go back to the kitchen and uh, the, the traditional family should be revived and that migration is, uh, is, uh, is uh, depressing the wages of, 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 of German workers. I mean, that's, we've got two lefts. And, and you know, people like me, who've been, you know, my entire life a Marxist, have had to belatedly come to the conclusion that you have to pick your side, um, as E.P. Thompson did in, in, in uh, The Poverty of Theory. And I've kind of, I criticised myself for waiting too long to decide that there is either an internationalist left that is open to socially liberal values and wants to make an alliance with the Enlightenment and liberalism, and there's a nationalist left that actually non-coincidentally is very heavily uh, um, invested in anti-humanist Marxism and in, in the Marxism of post-structuralism um, and I think that we I saw it within Corbynism it's what killed Corbynism um, and I think we and in the book there's a very strong theme <coughs> of self-critical of not just saying the left made mistakes you know it, it is the truth that certainly in the KPD and the German Communist Party, there were they were trying to fish in the same pool as the Nazis were, um, of young unemployed men who wanted a nationalist solution, uh, a, a national anti-capitalist revolution. No, we have to just be critical of it. So on, on your other point, I take your point absolutely clearly about the be you know the yes, I mean the experience of Corbyn shows the experience of Corbyn shows, and indeed the experience of Trump v Biden shows that there are sections of American capital that are very happy to accommodate to, to a Trump that is absolutely <clears throat> openly accommodating to the far right. So yeah, it, it's not, coming back to the, 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 the Reich quote, which I will end with, you know, the fear of freedom triggered by a glimpse of freedom is the impulse that is driving the new far right. And I don't think it will need an anti-systemic government like say a Corbyn government, it's simply the fact that climate change necessitates ripping up the whole deep structure, the radical structure of capitalism. And, and as I said, as we, you alluded to before, it, even if what we emerge with is a form of capitalism, it will be so different that most capitalists won't like it. So I think that, that what, the, what the far right, the, the logic behind the far right's new thought architecture is that at some point, Climate chaos may indeed trigger a systemic crisis of Western democracy, um, maybe by a new migration wave or, or I mean, the form of the, the economic situation we're in right now. When, when we, you, people talk about you know, shortages of silicon chips, well, that's not just because of economic nationalism in China and Taiwan. It's also because Taiwan's in the middle of a climate change induced drought and can't produce chips because there's no water.
So eventually, the fascists hope that we'll hit that. And what I think we need to do is we need to, above all, people are rightly obsessed with solutions to climate change. Climate change. There's a lot of positivism around, and I mean that phil philosophical positivism around climate change. You know, we, you know we, if we are rational, we can produce a solution. They've got to realize that the fascists are placing themselves in on route to that solution. They will stop it, and they will they will they will revel in the chaos it creates. And you you, I, I wish I could write. You know. Uh, only books about the positive things in the world and uh, the hopeful things in the world. But I, I've just become convinced unless we both confront fascism and the weaknesses of the left and liberal traditions in failing last time abysmally and abjectly to defeat it, then um, I, you know, um, as I finished the book with the image of me peering into that gas chamber in Maidanek, you know, I, I probably have distant relatives who 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 may have suffered that fate i do not want to suffer it myself so it's simply a question of self-preservation that we have this debate now uh, while it's early enough to have it we don't want to be having it in in our own you know we don't want to be having it in a jail cell as the turkish left has to have that that debate let's have it now while we're able to thank you very much um to both of you i mean paul started his talk with a uh, it's an alarming prognosis, really, that, that uh, a tradition against which our uh, fathers, mothers and grandparents all fought has uh, returned in a certain form of way and that the firewall is on fire, as he put it. And he went on to characterise what he said was a, a different beast. Perhaps we could say a kind of new fascism. But he prescribed certain opportunities to resist that. And we've had a very interesting discussion with Professor Leia uh, Upi, in which he's asked some penetrating questions about Paul Mason's thesis, about how he sees the ideology of fascism, its history, and the possibility of resistance, and culminated, I think, with a fascinating uh, debate about the relationship between fascism and capitalism. So thank you very much. Can you join me, if you can, metaphorically, in thanking both our speakers, Paul Mason and Professor Leia Upi. Thank you, Leah. Thanks very much. And thank you, Robin. I'll do this. No pass around. <laughs> That's right. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> Absolutely. Thanks a lot.